Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome, and wherever you're joining us, whichever time zone. Um, very happy to, to welcome you here. Uh, this is the July edition of our CEFI Ethics webinar series for 2021. And I'm really excited to be hosting um, today's session on justice and community engagement in engineering education. Um, I'm Sarah Janaid. Um, I'm from. I'm a senior, senior lecturer from uh, Birmingham, um, Aston University in Birmingham, UK. And um, I'm joined by four other speakers as part of our panel. I'm very pleased to have them join us. Um, before I introduce them, they all come from very interesting, intriguing uh, backgrounds. So they'll each give us an, uh, their own perspective and experiences. So today what we'll do is we'll have each speaker speak for 20 minutes and then give them 10 minutes for Q&A. And then um, at the end, we'll, if there's some time at the end, we'll open it up to a more general debate. So this will take two hours, but if you need to, to leave, that's fine, no problem. Um, this will be recorded, you can catch up later. Now, before we begin, um, I wanted to remind, uh, tell you about the next seminar. I believe it's going to be 20th of October and it will be on water ethics and responsible engineering. So a very relevant topic to today, I think. Um, and you can register through our CEFI website. And there's also a newsletter you can sign up to there and that will give you any relevant events and also uh, topical discussions. So the final thing before we start, housekeeping. There are three things I wanted to mention. First, any technical issues. Um, Clara's helping us run this thing smoothly, so thank you. You can uh, message her if there are any issues. Um, second, uh, this webinar is recorded, so that's something to let you know. And thirdly, for q and I'm going to keep an eye out for the chat. Um, but we'd love to hear from you too. So if you do have a question, you can raise your hand through the icon and I'll call your name and unmute and, and the floor is yours. So let's begin. I'd like to introduce um, our first speaker for today. Um, so Khalid Kadir is a continuing lecturer at UC Berkeley, USA. Uh, he teaches courses um, in global poverty and practice program, political economy and civil and environmental engineering. After completing his PhD in environmental engineering at Berkeley, Khalid focused his research on the complex role that engineering expertise plays in the politics of international development and poverty alleviation. And his current work focuses on the intersection of poverty, expertise and politics. It's such a brave thing to do, so I'm really excited to hear more. And he is the recipient of the 2017 Distinguished Teaching Award uh, which is UC, UC Black Berkeley's most prestigious honor for teaching. And with that, thank you, Khaled, for, uh, for coming here, and I'll uh, hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Sarah. That's really wonderful. Uh, I'm super excited to be here, and I'm excited about uh, all of the folks who are coming. I'll start with a very brief, short apology. I'm on my way out to do some uh, humanitarian disaster relief work. And so as soon as I finish talking, I'm out the door heading out to a plane. So I promise I will stick around and watch the recording after because I'm really interested in this gathering and this group. And it sounds like next month I'm going to be here to learn about water ethics so, or two months from now. So I look forward to that. So let me dive in and I'll share my slides here really quickly. Um, you know, I tried to I tried to maybe poke a little with the title and be a little bit provocative by by saying ethics is not enough. And then, you know, as I was putting this together, I was like, OK, maybe, you know, may, maybe I don't feel totally that way. But I want to clarify what I mean. And I think that'll come through with um, with the, the talk I'm going to give today. Um, I think that ethics engineering, ethics education, as we do it in engineering today is not enough. And I think we need to push for a deeper engagement with how we think about what ethics are and what they mean. Um, and, and the way that I think we need to push that I'm gonna argue for today is that we need to take a very sort of, some have called it like a macro ethics approach. Uh, I prefer to think of it as taking a stance that uh, we, we as engineers and as engineering educators should be pushing our students and our colleagues and ourselves to take an approach to engineering that centers justice. That what we should be doing, given the sort of world that we live in, and perhaps this is for any time, but let me say for now, that taking a, a stance towards justice is an important thing that we do. 
And one of the reasons for this is because of this idea that there, there's no such thing as not being political. So, you know, you can't stand still on the moving train, as Howard Zinn puts it, uh, or, or as, as George Monbiot says, uh, if, if, you, if you claim you have no politics, it means that the, the world's working out for you, that things are going okay for you and you're happy with it, and that's why you can make that claim. Uh, and I think that for too long as engineers, this has been the sort of general stance that like, no, no, we do the technical stuff. We're not the political people, but that's very easy to say because it was working out for us. Reasonably well-paid jobs, reasonable job security, sort of not in, under the, the eyes of a lot of discontent from, from the public. So it was a way of sort of hiding behind this sort of technical, apolitical stance. And I think that that's led us to being part of injustice, quite frankly, as opposed to taking a more justice-paced approach. So my argument today is that given that there's no way of not being political, I think we need to take a very certain political stance and that we need to orient ourselves towards justice. So what I wanna talk about, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to talk quickly because I'm actually way more interested in the conversation uh, we all likely hear ourselves talk more than we want to. So uh, I want to just quickly go through some things on engineering ideologies and this idea of rendering technical and talk about a movement from, from do good engineering to a justice oriented approach. Um, and then I'll, I'll mention very briefly something that I've been doing at uh, UC Berkeley where I teach to try to move in that direction uh, feebly at best. Um, so First, building off of uh, the work of Erin Ketch, a scholar who's now at University of Michigan, uh, she argues in a, in a paper of hers from 2014 that we have a culture of disengagement from issues of public concern and from issues of public good within engineering. In fact, she argues that as our students move through engineering programs, their concern for social issues decreases. Which, which to me is was when I first read that it was like a it was like a, a someone someone like hit me because it was like wow students move through the programs that I'm teaching in and they start out caring about something and by the time they get to the end they care a little bit less and I would hope for the opposite that they would care more for public concern issues and less for their own individual issues um, and I, and and she identifies what she describes as three ideological pillars to this culture of disengagement. And the first one is depoliticization. The idea that, that we should be disconnected from social and political things because that's gonna mess up our objective professional practice. And, and she notes that this, this sort of first conceals the value laden uh, and social nature of the work that we do with these claims of objectivity and rationality. And second, that it helps frame social justice issues such as how our engineering may make poverty worse or, or drive inequality or how it may the work we do might marginalize disabled people or incorporate patriarchy or racism into the systems we create. Those questions become irrelevant to the work of engineering. They're outside that. Leave that to the sociology department to think about that. That's sort of what happens in this depoliticization that these are not legitimate areas of concern within engineering. These are things to be handled by other disciplines. We just need to sort of build the technical systems. Uh, the second ideology that she that she identifies is this dualism that the technical and social, this is also deeply gendered, this idea that what we do is technical, these other things are social, the sort of hard, soft difference, and, and the social things are at best of secondary importance. Um, I think these days in, in my own university, the, the social side of, of things that is getting the most attention is that engineers need to be able to communicate better, that that must be where our problem is. And it's like, this is, this is like a far cry from thinking about a deeper social investigation of the world that we're a part of and we're helping to construct. And what's interesting is she notes that this isn't just a cognitive process, but within engineering cultures, this is seen as a moral imperative, that this is the right way to do engineering. And, and I think this isn't really unique to engineering. I think this is, this is spreading into higher education and perhaps education more broadly, the increasing instrumentalization of education to treat education as a process of learning a set of specific concrete skills as opposed to education as a process of cultivating a certain kind of 
thinker, a certain kind of person, a certain kind of engaged community member. And when, when I say those words, part of me is like, oh, this sounds like some elite thing, education for cultivating critical thinkers. But this is really at the root of the argument for public education in many ways, for people to be engaged in the place where they live and have the tools to do that, as opposed to people having skills so they can go work for a company and make that company higher profits. Um, the third ideology she brings up, which is one I'm going to focus less on today, is this idea of meritocracy, which, um, which is perhaps the most obvious one that exists within engineering cultures, is the idea that those who, those who have succeeded, it's because they worked really hard and they were dedicated. And, and I want to note that this belief denies the relationality of poverty and marginalization, the way these two are connected to one another, that some are wealthy only because others are poor. Some are marginalized so that others can be made central. Um, and this is also a, a deeply self-serving belief when it's put forward by those who are themselves in positions of power and, and uh, success. The other piece that I wanna talk about a little bit is this idea of rendering technical. And here I'm, I'm building off the work of uh, Tanya Lee. Um, and, and she's not speaking about engineers particularly, she's speaking about de international development practitioners, but it, it struck me when I read this text that she could be speaking about engineers, that we spend a lot of time training our students to draw these boxes, these, you know, we so control volumes. Uh, and it's sort of a very routine methodology within engineering education. Draw your control volume, describe your system, you know, what, uh, define the problem, define the solution, you know, what's coming in, it's hot air, what's coming out, it's cold air, now inside build an air conditioner. So that's sort of how we, uh, that's like a classic methodology within our profession is to draw these kinds of boxes and to describe problems in technical terms. And, and I'm, I'm noting here that we also define the problem and the solution too. We define what counts as cold enough air and that, that lets us know that we've actually solved the problem. So it's not like there are these inherently existing problems and solutions, but these are expert designs that, that both claim certain things as problems and others as solutions. And in the process, the outside world becomes sort of irrelevant. It becomes separate from the, the thing we're trying to solve. So there's, there's a very good reason for doing this. We do this to simplify a problem. Uh, and and it's a, it is a pragmatic tool within engineering in order to drill down and narrow a problem, talk about basic physical, chemical, biological principles in order to solve or, or do, deal with the systems we want to deal with. However, at the same time, in addition to accomplishing that pragmatic goal, drawing boxes lends us to a number of exclusions. We, we, we don't address problems, but instead we, we tackle symptoms of those problems. And this is the thing that, that Tanya Lee calls rendering technical. And it's premised on the technical social dualism that Aaron Ketch writes about. And it involves the depoliticization of problems as well as decontextualizing problems. So history disappears from the way we approach engineering problems. At best, there's maybe a minor anecdote about history, but really it's not seen as germane at all to the solution. Which note, excluding history is a very non-justice oriented approach. Justice really starts with thinking about the history that gets us into a situation. In addition, we, we take problems and we assume that they're the same everywhere. In my own sort of specialty of water and sanitation, water and sanitation are the same everywhere. You know, you, you come up with a treatment plant idea and you apply that all over the world as though context is not really important. And sure, we might deal a little bit with different climates, but that's about the most. We don't think about social and political context at all. And, and in, in this process of exclusion, we also draw ourselves out of the boxes. Too often, I think engineers see themselves as not in any way connected to the problems that they are addressing. Uh, and this sort of, it's almost as though we live in outer space and are dealing with things here on Earth. And in reality, we are parts of the communities or parts of the, the larger global world that we are uh, acting on. Uh, Timothy Mitchell writes really interestingly about this in Rule of Experts uh, about USAID intervening in Egypt. And the, and the well-meaning practitioners doing those interventions never came to see themselves as connected to Egypt. 
sort of negating the larger history of U.S. deep involvement in Egypt and the fact that the US, Egypt is the, was the second largest recipient of U.S. aid money. And these sorts of connections run very thick and are not lost on Egyptians. And yet the practitioners, the technical practitioners, didn't see that connection. They somehow saw Egypt as over there and separate. And I think by drawing ourselves out of problems, we avoid some of the deeper ethical issues that we need to think about when we approach solving those problems. So as a result of these boxes, our engineering work is, is lacking. We approach symptoms, we don't really get at problems. And even worse, we can often reinforce structures of oppression and marginalization. We're often serving those who have money because they can afford to hire us to do these sorts of projects. We're often promoting a very specific version of industrialization uh, and, and in doing so, we, we are propping up those who are already the most powerful in society. And this sort of becomes a little more concerning at that point because it's sort of like, which side are we on in those moments? So, but what about this sort of push that, that is increasingly large about, well, let's do engineering for good. Everything from uh, you know, engineers without borders, to the sort of you know, social innovation labs, uh, supporting engineering work. Can we just innovate in ways that target good outcomes or positive outcomes. And yes, I think that's great, but I think we still end up addressing symptoms. And in so much as problems are tied to context, history and power, techno fixes are gonna work around these issues. We're never gonna stop the constant reproduction of the problems whose symptoms we're trying to tackle one at a time. And instead, I think we need to rethink our orientation towards engineering. And, and I draw on an op-ed written in 2018 by Casey Gerald. In, in it, he describes how he was the poster child for the American dream. He was a black child born into poverty. He went on to play football at Yale. He went to work at Wall Street. And then he went to work in the Obama administration. It was sort of this fairy tale story. And yet he doesn't see himself as a symbol of the American dream. Instead, he, he quite wisely, I would say, sees himself as an exception, not the rule. And towards the end of the piece, he has this very beautiful line where he says, we need to stop substituting hopeful stories for justice. I think too often we're holding up these individual success stories and we're ignoring the larger number of people who don't manage to succeed because of the larger structural issues that we're dealing with. And so I think while engineering for good may be very well intentioned and it may bring us stories of hope and in specific cases, individualized success, I think it also falls short. And I wanna argue in the spirit of Gerald's piece that we really need to think instead about the engineering for justice and specifically social justice. So how do we go about doing that? I think, well, go back to how I sort of framed the problem. I think we start by, by including history in a meaningful way in our work. We start thinking about how engineering may rectify historical injustices, how engineering may, may make up for past practices that have resulted in current inequalities. This opens up conversations about the, the role of engineering in, in reparations or in affirmative actions to rectify historical trajectories based on injustices. I think uh, another piece of this is for us to focus deeply on this issue of relationality how poverty and marginalization are connected to wealth and power, how, how privilege and oppression are two sides of the same coin. And, and to, to not think that we're in the business of just trying to lift everyone up, but to recognize that we live in relation to others and that some are lifted up precisely on the shoulders of others or on the backs of others, as the case may go. Um, and, and I think another piece that we need to take seriously, which is the one that I'm most interested in and the one that I think has proven most difficult is that we need to think about how we may center the voices of marginalized folks in the work that we do. Giving those who are on the front lines of the issues that we're dealing with voices, if not central voices at the tables that we're a part of. So if we're working on engineering solutions for climate change, might we start by thinking about well, who's on the front line, who's in most by this, and how might we center those voices in our approach to climate change? Instead of those who are wealthiest or in the greatest power positions who, who or may have the most funding and letting them drive the agenda, because they're the ones who drove the agenda into the problem we have now in the first place. So can we think about a different justice-based approach there? 
in all of this, embedding such concerns within engineering education is first going to require an epistemological transformation. How do you know what you know? How can things be know, known? What are the methods we're going to use to produce engineering? And I think this is going to require us as engineers to value other forms of knowing outside of the quantitative, empirical, positive approaches that we use today. Uh, and, but this also has very practical implications. It's going to lead us to asking new and different research questions. It's going to lead us perhaps most obviously to using different research methods. It's going to force us to change our curriculum, not only add new courses, but also change the way we teach our current courses. And it's going to change how and where we as engineers do our work, who we work for, who, who we are accountable to in our work. And one approach that I've taken to that, and this is the second to last slide, and then hopefully we'll have a, a good conversation. Um, I've tried to, to create a, uh, a course at UC Berkeley, and now I've been, it's been, I've been teaching it for about eight years now, that takes justice very seriously in engineering. And I've, I've done it through the lens of environmental justice. Uh, the course title, Engineering Environment Society, is, is sort of an attempt to think about how might we engage as engineers in the environmental justice movement in America, and how might we bridge between civil environmental engineering and social justice uh, issues. We, we, we engage with drinking water, storm water, wastewater, natural water, uh, air pollution, infrastructure, and waste disposal. All of these issues come up in the course, but they're all taken through a much more social scientific lens to think about how is it that technical experts are intervening in these deeply politicized terrains. We do this through a number of community partnerships, and this is the most challenging and also the most rewarding and inspiring part of the course. We, we work with between five and seven different local regional environmental justice organizations on projects developed before the term starts that are have a technical component, but they're fundamentally projects that are about justice, that are done on the terms of these different communities mediated by these organizations that, that help students come to see their engineering work in a much different light. That, that, or at least attempts to help students see their engineering work, not as technical work, but instead as people work. And I think that's really sort of where I come down to it at the, at the root is what would it mean for us to see engineering as a people-centered discipline as opposed to a, a widget or technical-centered discipline. And I'll end on this quote because that idea is not a new one. Uh, Dr. King many years ago argued that we must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. And it's, it's just amazing to see the language he uses here in 1967 machines and computers, profit motives and property rights. When these are considered more important than people, racism, extreme materialism and militarism are incapable of being conquered. So with that, I'll, I'll stop here and uh, invite thoughts, reflections, critical or not, uh, please. I'd love to have a conversation about this. Thank you, Khalid. Um, that's a really nice start um, to this session. Um, any questions? I'll, I'll hand it to the floor first. There's nothing in the chat, so if anyone wants to raise their hand, or I can begin with one. Put my hands up. Sorry. No, I'm sorry, Patricia, I missed you. On my, my yeah, go ahead. Khalid, I'm really interested in your journey. So um, how did you start to care? What opened your eyes? It's a great question. You know, it's... Uh, uh, I stumbled. I didn't have this focus from the outset. Uh, I think I was a very different person when I started graduate school. Um, and it, the journey, the transition happened in graduate school. My, my trainings in environmental engineering, my dissertation work, when I was completing my dissertation, one of my advisors made very clear to me uh, that, quote, you need to have a, a complete engineering dissertation i.e. these more social-ish concerns and these framing of engineering in terms of the politics of the work we do, this isn't part of your dissertation. If you're going to do that, that's an extra chapter. I don't care if you do it or not. So, so it was, a, it was the, the first barrier that I sort of ran into. The reason I started going down that road is I was studying natural treatment systems uh, and their applicability to developing nations. 
which which I started to think about, well, what what are these places? And I took a critical development theory class. And from there I started, it really flipped me upside down. And that's how I encountered Timothy Mitchell and, and Tanya Lee was, was to think critically about interve interventions from the West upon the rest. And then thinking about the role, primarily the literature that I read about this was about economics, really critic critically looking at how economics has shaped the world in a certain way. And I then applied that sort of critique of economic expertise to engineering. As a result, I'm now teaching political economy as well as engineering classes, because I think that they struggle from similar issues, this sort of expert knowledge imprinting a certain version of what is true and what is not. These sort of, you know, whether it's, whether it's supply and demand claimed as a law when really it's a theory, or if it's this idea of tragedy the common suddenly universalized to everyone in the world, despite so many examples of that not being the case with communal property, like thinking about those critiques of economics and then starting to apply them to, to engineering. And, and reading Timothy Mitchell's work was a really big movement point for me. And I think the other side of it was being in sort of social institutional spaces with social scientists who were thinking critically about that stuff really helped me to understand how to see my own work very differently. That's so interesting. Because a lot of the barriers that I'm facing with other colleagues is, is, is this, this just this not very different way of seeing the world and, and no way into a conversation about it so I'm always really interested to find out how people make that transition if we can sort of surface that or find ways to to, to get yeah. these concepts you know yeah. and and I've run into some of those same barriers uh and I think it was interesting when this course was first being created uh it was basically rejected from the civil and environmental engineering department at Berkeley they didn't want it and it was placed in a different department because the 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 logic for creating this course had had I would say little to do with the content and more to do with a um, um, sort of diversity problem as they like to frame it at Berkeley that they just really didn't they weren't serving students that came from underrepresented backgrounds very well and they were basically pushing them out of engineering once they came in not only not letting many in but pushing them out and so they wanted to create a. a a course as, as well as some other programmatic pieces to sort of better serve those students to make engineering relevant to their own lives and their own communities. And as a result, this course came to in, into existence funded by the equity and inclusion folks, not by a department. Well, six years on, and now civil and environmental engineering has gone through a bit of a, a, a shift in, in leadership in particular, and they've taken the course back. So now I'm housed where it should be because that's uh, like, you know, topically it's the most sensible place for it. But it was interesting to see how that shift happened. At one point rejected and now very much embraced and loved in many ways. So I, I think that like those barriers among colleagues are real. Uh, one of the things that helped break those down for me was in-person conversations. Literally like running into a more senior faculty member. Hey, can I talk to you? No, I'm going to the train. I was like, I'll walk you to the train. And that conversation really shifted like, oh, you're, you're not out to get us. You're, you're not out to say everything we do is dumb. No, of course not. I'm just trying to help us think about how to do it differently. And I think there's a fear of radicalism. There's a fear of like the sort of any critique of engineering is taken very sort of personally. And I think that's part of the challenge is engineering identities are so wrapped up in a certain way of seeing oneself as opposed to a broader sense of us as, as more complex humans. And then any critique of engineering becomes a critique of an engineer. And I think that's part of the problem. Uh, we can have one more question and then we can move on to the next speaker. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, sorry, was that? Yes. So Khalid, I mean, I really like this presentation. I've read a lot of the work you talk about. And so in terms of a very pragmatic issue, I mean, I'm not at Berkeley, so I have large classes. I'm teaching these students who I want to grapple. I want them to grapple with these issues. And the question that always comes up is, I want a job in Amazon. How can I get it, right? So you talk about the political economy and the political economy of this country is that a lot of the students, my students, just wanna make do first of all, right? Doing good, even if they want to, is a far cry from where they are, right? And so moving them along that path is what I find 
you know, that's the hard part. There's the struggle. I don't, I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. I think we should always do that as academics, but I think that's where the real rubber hits the road kind of thing is, right? Totally agree. Totally agree. And, you know, I'm, I'm very careful to, um, we can't make broad critiques of choices people make because their circumstances are their circumstances. How Absolutely. many family members are you trying to support? Then you better go make that money to support all those family members, like these kinds of things. Um, particularly when we think about students from underrepresented backgrounds who are trying to get out of impoverished situations. The, 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 the answer to me lies that this cannot be an individual process. We're not as individuals all going to make these transitions. I think it needs to be a more collective process where we think about, well, what, what do we want the world for, for us or our children or whoever to live in to look like? And how can we collectively help get there? Because, and this is not unlike the climate change conversation. You Absolutely. and I may decide not to fly, but are we going to tell everyone else, like, that's, that's not going to solve the problem, and that relies on individual ethics, and that's one of the challenges, I think. I think it has to be a collective process, and we have to encourage students to create communities of practice and to, to work together on sort of moving themselves in a direction that they collectively want to move. Great point. I agree, yeah. Right, thank you, Khaled. Thank you, everyone, for the questions. I'll move on to the second speaker and um, all the best with the project that you're rushing off to. Um, so our second speaker is Jason Borenstein, um, who is the Director of Graduate Research Ethics Programs and Associate Director of the Center for Ethics and Technology at George Tech, USA. His appointment is divided between the School of Public Policy and Office of Graduate Studies. He's also affiliated faculty at the Institute of Robotics and Intelligent Machines and um, is involved in several journals and resources on ethics, an impressive list, so I will list them here. He's an associate editor for the journal Science and Engineering Ethics, founding editor of the Journal of AI and Ethics, co-editor of the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy Ethics, um, an editorial member of Journal Accountability and Research, He's also the editor of Research Ethics for the National Academy of Engineering Online Ethics Center and the founder and formal edi editor-in-chief of Journal of Philosophy, Science and Law. Um, his research interests include bioethics, engineering ethics, robotic, robot ethics and research ethics. And from a personal point of view, the, um, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Ethics was my go-to when I started reading about ethics and philosophy. So from that Thank you, Jason, um, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the very kind introduction. And I, I only have a very small role with the Stanford Encyclopedia, so I do need to temper that a little bit. I'm director of one of the uh, co-director of one of the sections of that encyclopedia. I certainly had did not have a role in founding it, but again, thank you for the kind introduction. And certainly welcome to all of you from the various different time zones across the globe. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm certainly happy to answer whatever you'd like during the course of the presentation. Uh, you don't have to wait to the end. It's probably going to be easiest through chat, I'm guessing, um, which I have up on my screen if anyone does uh, have any uh, questions or comments during the course of this. Uh, I assume you can see my slides okay. I haven't heard any objections yet, so I, I think they're up there okay. Um, so yes, I'm a professor at Georgia Tech, and uh, I am a philosopher. Uh, my training is in philosophy and ethics. Uh, and largely what I'm going to talk about today is an ongoing five-year, now six-year project with a no-cost extension from the National Science Foundation, a uh, project that we've been conducting at Georgia Tech. So I'd like to thank from the front end some of my collaborators. So I work with my co-PI, or one of my co-PIs is Dr. Zagura, who's in the College of Computing. Uh, Daniel Schiff is a, our primary graduate student on the project, and we also have a research scientist, Jonah Lee, who's working on this project uh, at the current time. Uh, there is the acknowledgement to the program uh, at the National Science Foundation. Uh, given that this is an international audience, I might just take a very quick aside that uh, the program that has funded this, which is called CCE STEM, which stands for Cultivating Cultures of Ethical STEM, the primary focus of that program, which has since changed its name over the last couple of years, but at the time it was funded, it was called this at the National Science Foundation. The main goal of that program 
was to try to figure out what kinds of cultural factors, whether it's in a department, at an institution, at a company, or in other places or in other ways, figure out what kinds of cultural factors contribute towards ethical thinking or on the other side of the coin erode it. So this is one of the uh, one of the projects within that domain, within that funding program of the National Science Foundation, that's trying to look at what kinds of factors may promote ethical thinking, ethical reasoning, ethical decision making, et cetera. And so that's largely what I'm going to talk about is our approach at Georgia Tech, this particular project, uh, again, funded by the National Science Foundation. And I'll put up the link for the project a couple of different times, but this is where you'll find most of our resources, uh, publications, things of that sort uh, related to the project. So I don't think I need to say much more about Aaron Check. Uh, <laughs> Thankful, thankful for the first speaker who said quite a bit more than I was planning to, but it does help set the stage in terms of where this project came from, talking about Czech and others. The general idea that we have seen disconcerting findings in the literature that uh, students, uh, especially engineers in the case of Czech study, uh, students' concern for the public's well-being has been diminishing over time during the course of their degree. Uh, again, since that was talked about already, I don't think I'm going to say much more than that, but at least helps set the stage for why we decided to approach the, the project in the way in which we, we approached it. Uh, also, of course, uh, I'm at Georgia Tech, so we're a large engineering institution. Roughly 65 to 70 percent of our students are either in engineering of some form or fashion or in computing. So we are largely talking about technology in every conversation we're having. <laughs> That's a slight exaggeration, but it's pretty close to true. Pretty much every course, uh, every, uh, guest lectures, things of that sort, technology is interwoven in what we're doing. And given that's the case, uh, our students are going to likely go out in the world, work for a lot of companies, especially if they're not gonna stay in the academic work, uh, realm, work for a lot of companies that are making decisions, obviously about uh, technologies that can impact society quite dramatically. And so we're thinking that, of course, we want ethics to be a, an important part of their decision making as they're designing, deploying, uh, developing technologies for use. Also, a part of what contributed to the project I'm going to describe is that when we were proposing this work, Georgia Tech was in the process of deciding on its quality enhancement plan, uh, which is called Serve, Learn, Sustain. The general idea, uh, and this is largely focused at the undergraduate level at our institution, the general idea was to try to connect Georgia Tech students more directly to the communities that, that their work might impact, to work with communities more as partners, to listen to the community's concerns more directly, and not just develop for them which is often what has happened historically, not just at our institution, but at many institutions, is that the expert knowledge that scientists and engineers think they have, they of course make design decisions for communities, but we're hoping they'll make design decisions with communities, that communities will be more engaged in the design decision-making process. So serve, learn, sustain is one piece of that puzzle that we were hoping for to get students and others more engaged in the communities that they might help serve. So our project, although it was not directly affiliated with Serve, Learn, Sustain, our quality enhancement plan, we thought it would, it would very definitely help complement it. So just to give you a sense of what the project is that I keep alluding to. So again, it's a it was originally a five-year project that's gonna go into six years. Uh, and I'll give you an overview of this as we go forward is that it, there's a myth, mixed methods design, which I'll describe in more detail in the, in the few, next few slides. Um, the quantitative component is largely associated with a particular survey that we drew from the literature and, and revised over time. Our qualitative components have to do with uh, interviews of students, which I'll, I'll describe as well. And I should mention that we have both uh, descriptive and causal aims associated with the project. In other words, we want to describe how students are changing over time in terms of their perceptions of their responsibilities to the public. And we're also hoping, perhaps more ambitiously, to see where cause and effect is occurring. In other words, if they take a particular course, if they have a particular community engagement experience, does that have more of a direct impact 
on a student's decision making, the student's thinking, especially in terms of what they think their obligations to the public are. So this is an overview of what we've done. Uh, it's we've essentially done our uh, our data collection. We're largely in the data analysis phase, but here's a very quick overview of what we're what we're up to with this project. So essentially, we're we're following multiple student groups, but the main one is I'll refer to as our primary cohort is all undergraduate students that entered Georgia Tech in fall 2017. Essentially, we wanted to know what was going on with them from the time they entered Georgia Tech to the time they graduate. And more specific than that, what we wanted to know is what community engagement activities are they taking part in and whether and how those community engagement activities are impacting their perceptions of their responsibilities to the public. Whether it's community engagement activities inside a classroom, whether it's co-curricular, extracurricular, whether it's with a sorority fraternity, whether it has to do with their dorm, um, a living learning, learning community of some sort, whether their community engagement activities are having some kind of tangible impact on their perceptions of their responsibilities to the public. And there are a few main branches uh, 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 related to our primary co cohort, in other words, data collection points. So we surveyed them three main times uh, when they first entered Georgia Tech, uh, or just before actually, at the midpoint of their undergraduate degree, and just this last spring when they were going to be close to graduation. And we also interviewed a subset of the undergraduate, this undergraduate population, this primary cohort, at two different time points. So what we're talking about in terms of this cohort is several thousand students. At one point, it was close to 3,000 students. Now, of course, not all of them have participated <laughs> but in these different surveys, but we tried to survey as many of them as were willing across these three time points for the survey. And then we did a subset of that cohort, uh, roughly 20-ish students, around 22 or so, at these two different time points for the interviews. And I'll describe some of this work in more detail in the next few slides, although I do need to go a little more quickly so I don't run out of time. So our main research questions uh, that we're trying to answer are listed here, uh, which I'm perfectly happy to talk more about. Uh, so as I've alluded to, essentially what we're looking at or trying to unearth is whether social responsibility attitudes change in these students in our primary cohort over the time that they're here at Georgia Tech. Most of them will be students from engineering given our student population, but not all of them are from engineering. We also, over the course of time, wanted to learn, and this is based on the theoretical foundation that really influenced us, which I'll talk about soon uh, from Bellafeld and Canny, uh, what the relationship is between their perceptions of their personal responsibilities to the public versus their professional responsibilities to the public. So in other words, we, from the literature and from our own work, have figured out that students might think they personally, in their own personal life, have a responsibility, for example, to give to charity, but that doesn't necessarily carry over to their thinking about what the responsibilities are as a professional. So they may think they have direct responsibilities during their free time, when they're not on the clock, so to speak. But this, again, doesn't necessarily carry over to what they think they need to be doing as an engineer, for example. So we're trying to figure out whether there are bridges that help, that help, uh, help address this gap. So again, the, this gap potentially between what they think their responsibilities are in their personal life versus their professional life. And then, of course, we're trying to figure out what experiences or factors contribute to improving or enhancing students' sense of responsibilities to the public. A lot of our work is influenced by, as I was just alluding to, Bellafeld and Canny. Um, I, was, I can show the reference later if you'd like. Uh, they helped develop what's called the Professional Social Responsibility Development Model. Uh, three main elements to it, which I could talk more about later if you'd like. But our survey, the primary survey we're using in this work, has question items that are associated with these three main constructs. Uh, constructs largely being what they think their responsibilities are in their personal life, 
what kinds of professional skills they think they have, which is largely associated with item two. And then thirdly, whether they think their profession has a responsibility to address ethical concerns or other, uh, other concerns that are, aren't purely technical, whether they're connecting their professional knowledge to concerns about, for instance, the public's well-being. So these are built into the survey items of the survey that we've been using during the course of this work. I don't know why it's going line by line there, but anyway. So the qualitative component, and, and I'll apologize, I'll go a little more quickly than, than I, I originally planned, but our, our quantitative design um, is, is affiliated or associated with the survey we're using, which was adapted from Kenny and Bellefeld uh, from the 2015 publication. So essentially, I'll just make this a uh, bit more brief. Uh, they developed a survey that was studying engineers based on the theoretical model that I just uh, alluded to the last slide. What we did is we modified uh, the survey in a few main kinds of ways, including that we made it more discipline neutral because we wanted to study not only engineers, but all, all other students from all of the programs at our, at our institution. But we also added items more specific to Georgia Tech. So for example, we would ask specifically about social clubs or community engagement activities more directly related to our campus and made it a little less generic uh, from what was the original survey item. And what we call our tool is the Generalized Professional Responsibility Assessment, which is openly available on the project's website. And I'm happy to share uh, more information about it if anyone would like to use it. It takes approximately, depending how many questions you use, about 15 to 20 minutes for a student to complete it. Study population, I, I talked about already, which was the undergraduate students who started in fall 2017. Uh, we surveyed them three main time points. We also have secondary sample, which I won't talk about in a lot of detail today in the interest of time. Some of what we're looking for is whether their attitudes towards the public are changing over time. And there are constructs and subcontracts in the survey that help try to, uh, try to get us to help evaluate this including whether they emphasize certain things more strongly than others, for example, helping the public versus wanting to make a good or a high paying, uh, wanting to obtain a high paying salary. And something that we've been trying to evaluate more directly over the course of time is whether discipline based community engagement, like community engagement associated with one of their major classes, has any different impacts versus peer-based. So for example, an activity that they're doing largely to spend time with friends. So we're trying to figure out whether those have differential impacts. Um, again, ones more directly affiliated with their major or profession versus ones that are largely driven by them wanting to spend time with friends. So that's among the things we've been looking at. Key findings so far, um, I will, very strongly emphasize that we're still in the midst of data analysis. So our final data collection, which happened this past spring, our analysis of that data is still ongoing. So largely what I am sharing here is from the initial survey and the midpoint survey, um, the two first time points, not the third. Uh, thus far, we're finding that students' attitudes towards the public in terms of their attitudes related to social responsibility are fairly level or slightly declining from the beginning of the program to the midpoint, which unfortunately is fairly consistent with what we've seen in the literature, that uh, this is a fairly common trend among students. Also, one of the survey items we have has them rank essentially their priorities in terms of a future career. And it's pretty clear that salary becomes a more important concern as they're going forward in their, in their program versus helping people. So that's unfortunately not surprising, um, but it is uh, in some lights maybe a bit disconcerting. And another main finding we have is that female students tend to be on a higher but parallel track to male students. In other words, they start higher on the social responsibility scores and end higher, 
but they're fairly parallel. In other words, they're not showing a sharp increase or decrease as compared to male students. It's fairly similar. It's just, again, on a higher but parallel track is what we're finding. Qualitative design, uh, I'll just quickly give you a sense that we wanted to do a deeper dive in terms of what's what a subset of our cohort thinks about their activities on campus, uh, what's influencing their professional choices. So at two main time points, we've had roughly 30 to 45 minute interviews with again, a roughly 20 students, the same student group for more or less both time points, except for students who didn't agree for, to the second time point or the second interview. We're in the process of analyzing the second set of interviews. We've already analyzed the first set of interviews because they were conducted a couple of years ago. And again, we wanted to do a deeper dive, a, a more thorough analysis of what's influencing students' thinking in terms of their social responsibilities, career choice, etc. And so I'll skip some of this. Um, the, where the first data from the interviews is reported is in SHIF 2021. Um, who was the uh, main graduate student on the project. I can pull that reference up at the end if you'd like to see that. Uh, one other main slide I'll show, and then I'll try to skip to the end to leave time for discussion, is while we've been going through the data, looking at student interviews, uh, especially from the first round, which occurred about two years ago, we started to not only divide it up based on personal social responsibility, which I talked a little bit about before, about what you as an individual think your responsibilities are to your fellow human beings, but also your responsibilities as a professional, as an engineer, et cetera. And we wanted, based on what students had been saying in their interviews, we also decided to divide it up by a micro versus a macro focus in terms of micro focus being more of an individual one-on-one -on -one kind of decision, like how can I individually help you? How can I individually give to charity or help an individual person versus more of a macro focus, which is a larger scale kind of matter, which potentially would require an organization or group to help address it. So we wanted to see how students are not only parsing it based on this axis, uh, personal versus professional, but whether they're talking about it in terms of a small scale versus a larger scale. And roughly what we found is that uh, it's more likely that they're going to, if they see it at a micro scale, it's gonna translate to a professional micro scale kinds of issues, but it doesn't really translate uh, here uh, in terms of if they're seeing in their personal lives, big kinds of scale issues like the importance of equality for all, all human beings, they don't necessarily translate that in terms of having those responsibilities as a professional is what we saw in our first set of interviews. Uh, some of our limitations is that there's been students who have dropped out of our surveys. Um, of course, COVID has directly impacted our work, which I'm happy to talk about. So just to conclude, and again, apologize, apologies for going a little fast, but Social responsibility attitudes thus far for two years of a data analysis seem to be flat or declining. However, discipline-based community engagement, meaning associated with their major uh, or what their future profession is, may help maintain or increase one of the constructs, uh, one of the components of the theoretical model that, that we're relying on, the professional development one. And that peer-based community engagement, meaning roughly activities affiliated or associated with like social engagement with, with their peers, with fellow students, et cetera, helps uh, overall scores for the social um, responsibility model that we're relying on, especially for non-white students. I promised to provide the references, so I'll put them up here. And at this point, I wanna leave some time for discussion questions. So please let me know what I can say more about or what you're curious about. And uh, thank you for the invitation to speak today. Many thanks, Jason. Um, it, it's given me a few questions, but I'll ask, uh, open to the floor first. Um, if anyone wants to raise their hands. Can't see any on the chat or in the list. So my question, you mentioned that many of the students were engineering majors, but it was a mix. Mm -hmm. 
were you able to to analyze the difference between different um, specialities? So yes, yeah, so we we intentionally decided to send the survey to all undergraduates, regardless of major. Now our institution it, it is roughly sixty five to seventy percent computing and engineering students, which are separate colleges, but we a lot of times we pool them together. Um, I would say we're not seeing any strong trends quite yet. And one of the reasons why is that non-engineering students is a pretty small sample size relatively. So we're only talking about, you know, 30%-ish of the students are non-engineers. Um, so it's, it's rather difficult to make comparisons depending on the sample size, but we are endeavoring to do it. What we anecdotally, I can tell you, is through our interviews, which is even a smaller set of students, we're talking about roughly 20 people that we interviewed there at two time points. The ones that were in non-engineering majors said their majors had a much stronger, more direct influence on their attitudes towards the public. The engineering majors said their major didn't talk about it. This is being recorded, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say that too openly. <laughs> um, but they're, they're saying, the engineering students are saying their majors really don't talk about it. And they're saying their majors really don't have much, if any, impact on them having concern for the public's well-being. Um, it's really the non-engineering majors that that their major majors are talking about it more directly, and are are really speaking to, towards these kinds of issues and are making the students more attuned to them. So perhaps it feels like there's more of a disconnect with the engineering courses. Yes, personal I mean, versus professional. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yes, they are telling us, and again, we're talking about a small sample size, at least with the interviews. The, the survey population is much bigger, but the interview population is relatively small. But they're telling us that their majors, especially engineering majors, are not saying much about social responsibility, um, that they're finding it in other ways. They're finding it because of things like the Black Lives, Move, Black Lives Matter movement, um, because of things happening with COVID, um, because of friends, because of taking a course outside of their major, those tend to be stronger influences if they started to care about social responsibility, which not all the students have started to over the course of the degree. But for those that have become more attuned to it, they're saying the non-engineering sorts of stuff, for lack of a better way of describing it, are having a stronger influence on their perceptions of their responsibility to the public. Mm. We have a question from Diana Martin uh, in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. So the question is, what teaching methods you would see fit to contribute to that macro shift in understanding of professional responsibility? So what teaching methods or content would you would you advise? Um, I think a lot of times it's, so many of us who teach engineering ethics, which I've taught for quite a long time, uh, usually defer to case studies as at least a starting point for ethics into courses. That's not, of course, the only way, but that's a lot of where people start. I think a lot of it has to do with the scope or the focus. So are you talking about, you know, whether I'm supposed to be honest with a colleague or a collaborator? Am I supposed to share data with them honestly? So that's one kind of case study more at a micro scale, my personal interaction with another colleague. But there's also, you could take the case study to a much larger scale where you could talk about the responsibility of civil engineers or electrical engineers, et cetera, to design, you know, fill in the blank, whatever the technology is, design this technology so it helps the public or improves the public's well-being. So I think a lot of it has to do with the scope or the focus of the content you're introducing and at what scale um, you're really trying to get students acclimated to. Hmm. I have another question from Annabella. Uh, in your main findings, the conclusion slide, uh, it seems students' social responsibility decreases in higher levels. What are your thoughts about that? And what could be the reasons? Um, sorry, higher levels? Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to get the context. So, uh, I'm not sure if Annabella wants to elaborate if she means uh, at the senior level of the degree or? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, I was referring to the degree, in the, the higher degree. You mean as, a, as they advance in their career, as they get yes. more? Yes, yes. 
So in the uh, senior years, in the senior years. Yes, yes. Okay, so <laughs> sorry. I, sorry, I should be clear about that. So the data from senior years is not included yet because we haven't okay. anal we haven't finished that analysis. So we really only what I'm reporting today is up to the midpoint, up to two years in. So when they're essentially a halfway through their degree, we have the data from up to graduation, but we haven't analyzed it yet. Unfortunately, unfortunately for timing of today, <laughs> I don't have that data ready. Um, it's going to take us a while to analyze it. It's it, there, the sample size for for the survey is about 400 or so students. We're still analyzing that data, mm -hmm. and we have not fin finished analyzing the interview data for the second round, which was done in the spring. So we're started, but we're not we're not anywhere close to finishing the data analysis for the for the last stages of data collection. But we're, we'll be hoping to report that within the next next year or so. Um, depending on when, when when the work might be published. Okay, thank you. There no is problem. Another question. question. I am conscious of time, so I'll I'll keep that question to the end if that's okay. Um, that's fine. So I'll, I'll I'll move on to the third uh, speaker. In our third speaker is uh, Cristiano Cordero Cruz, who is a postdoctorate researcher at the Aeronautics Technological Institute, ITA, in Brazil. He has a background in both electrical engineering and philosophy, um, researching and acting in the fields of philosophy of engineering, engineering education, and engaged engineering. He is a member of the Brazilian Popular Grassroots uh, Engineering Network, REPOS, and collaborates with training students from ITA, REPOS, and Engineers Without Borders Brazil to perform emancipating, emancipating engineering. I'm really glad to have you with us, uh, Cristiano. I'll hand it over to you. Hello, uh, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. <laughs> we have people from different places. Here in Brazil, it's 1 p.m., so it's afternoon. <laughs> and I, first of all, would like to, to thank uh, the organizer for having me, me, having me here today. And well, I'll share with you some research and action I've been doing this Brazilian popular engineering. Well, uh, the presentation is divided in five main Arts, and I will start with a brief, brief introduction to popular engineering and its empowering goals. Then I will go to these empowering dimensions of social technical intervention in general. So, what is that about? What they have in mind when they try? We try to to empower communities and so on. And, and then I will turn to popular engineering's uh, ideal practitioner profile, which we call educated engineer, and to two popular engineering educative processes. I will briefly present them. And I will end this presentation with a summary uh, with uh, highlighting that this type of engineering is not only about a different or introducing ethics into mainstream or conventional engineering training, but is also about uh, addressing political, epistemological, and ontological issues. Well, as for Brazilian popular engineering, it arises in 2005 here in Brazil, conjugating these three main elements. It aims to foster solidarity economy ideals, and they do this through a social, uh, a technical, social technical team that assists these uh, initiatives or movements through uh, university extension or service learning. Here in Brazil, university extension is mandatory to every university. So through this type of service that every uh, university has to provide to community, it's the way popular engineering usually acts. And the, the social technical product of this intervention is called social technology, which is a later of spring of the 1960s and 1970s appropriate technology movements, uh, but with um, much more <laughs> critical sense uh, and emancipation that same at that. Well, also for popular engineering, Paul Frey's popular education is very central and also this action research methodology. So uh, because of that, because of the central role of Paul Frey, ideas, Paul Freire's ideas uh, to popular engineering. Its translation in Portuguese, we say Engenharia Popular, which the better translation into English would be grassroots engineering. But because popular education, which in Portuguese is Educação Popular, is consecrated as popular as the, the, the proper translation for English uh, of Paulo Freire's idea, so grassroots engineer decided to keep 
popular engineering instead of grassroots engineering, even though for uh, uh, English speakers, grassroots engineer conveys better the meaning of what's tried there. And also because of this affiliation to Paulo Freire's and Latin American uh, critical thinking, uh, what is mostly aimed at with popular engineering, what popular engineers look for, uh, is helping emancipate, uh, allowing or contributing with the groups uh, or they work with from social movements to emancipate themselves. And this emancipation here, uh, we understand as a deep, a deep and multiple empowerments. I will talk about empowerments uh, in the next slide. Uh, it started grassroots engineering assisting uh, isolated initiatives or grassroots groups, but after some years uh, they decided to uh, prefer to offer assistance or to work with social movements to, to improve their, their, their gains or the possibilities of change or Result, results they can could, can achieve. And examples of, so, of these social movements, we have this uh, waste picker movement. We have a lot of cooperatives of waste pickers in Brazil. It's a, a phenomenon that's uh, common in Latin America. Uh, also this landless rural workers movement, which is the strongest social movement here in Brazil. And uh, companies recovered by their workers, which are companies that went bankrupt and they were either occupied or reclaimed by their former employees. And they then started these workers to manage these companies. So these popular engineering teams assist them. So these are three examples of the social movements, but there are others along with popular engineering works e here in Brazil. And in 2014, popular engineer created this uh, pop engineering network we call uh, REPUS. And as for December 2020, last year, the numbers we have are these. Uh, popular engineers were present at 26 different Brazilian universities, most of them public universities. Uh, the, it has been practiced by 12 different teams. So there are some universities in which we have isolated practitioners, but not teams. And 49 direct members, people, either students, professors, or professionals that understand themselves as popular engineers and as members of, of REPLs of the network. But in addition to them, we have at least 250 other students, professors, and professionals involved in the uh, in the REPLs initiatives of popular engineering interventions in the country. As for the backgrounds of these people, most of them have uh, backgrounds in engineering, but there are also people with backgrounds in the humanities, in health science and practice and natural sciences. So this is for an overview, a general overview of popular engineering and the popular engineering network, REPUS. But uh, as I mentioned, popular engineering is committed to uh, emancipating, help the group or the social movement they are working with to increase their emancipation. But what the, does emancipation mean or what the empowerment, which I, I said emancipation is about radical multiple empowerments, but what's that about? So I'm relying here on a paper I co-authored with John Kleber. It's about to be published probably by the end of this month. And concerning the assisted part or partner community, uh, we identified at least eight different uh, empowering dimensions of social technical interventions. The first, the, first, the first and more evident of them is fostering social technical inclusion. So for instance, the community or group does not have access to drinkable water and the social technical assistance provide uh, or, or co, co construct with them one solution. It empowers the community to uh, better, to, uh, to, to uh, access a better life condition or to or foster or construct a better life condition for themselves. The second dimension is valuing cultural difference, which has to do with acknowledge, acknowledging different knowledges, values, and worldviews that the, the group. We work with may possess, and they can, be, they can be slightly or very different from the academic knowledge, yeah, value, and Western values, knowledge, and worldviews we, uh, the technical team, usually possess. 
and also uh, is establishing, uh, acknowledges this, this difference, establishing a horizontal, respectful and critical dia dialogue between these two, these two realities in order to incorporate these elements both into the technical practice itself, it's very interesting how the, that can happen, uh, in order for social technical solutions in a, can be constructed in accordance to the group's knowledge, values, and worldviews, and fostering or supporting this knowledge, values, and worldviews. So this is the second empowering dimension. It's the uh, social technical assistance can empower community to bring about the social technical order that support the values and worldviews this community or this group may have. The third dimension is nurturing qualitative relationships. Uh, in order for these changes to happen, it can, as we heard in the first uh, presentation uh, of this panel, it, it cannot be brought about individually, but only collectively. So in order for that to happen, um, uh, qualitative relationships must be nurtured. And both among the, the members of the communities, the community or the group that is being assisted, but between the community and the technical team. So once this is achieved, um, the best results can be obtained too. So we empower, we can use uh, the social technical intervention process as a way to strengthen the community bonds and its relationship with the technical team and it, this provides better results both as social technical solution and for the struggle the political struggle the community may be fighting fighting the fourth dimension is sharing technical competence we go there we construct with the community some uh, technical social technical solution and we can share with the community some technical competence knowledge and skills to keep the, to, to, to work with the, the, the social technical solution produced, to, to maintain and to solve problems. It empowers the community to deal with their technical challenges without having to rely on technical uh, expertise for an outside community. That's the fourth dimension. The fifth dimension is practicing investigative competences. We go there, we practice with them some um, we use some techniques, tools, in order to uh, identify problems, strengths, uh, weaknesses, and possibilities of solution. So if we share this, if we practice, and the community incorporates and internalizes this, this knowledge and can be able to, to use it, after we leave the community, the community is empowered with different tools and techniques to produce more knowledge and to construct different uh, solutions for this, the, the challenge they may have. The sixth dimension is promoting social and economic emancipation. In this picture uh, here, there is this very cheap irrigation system that was created by a, a, an engaged engineering team here in Brazil. And once this is incorporated into these poor rural uh, farm, farms, it allows the, the farmers to improve or to increase they are produced and also to increase their revenue and along with that to, to participate in a better condition in the social life of, of their, their community. Second dimension is cultivating political emancipation, allowing or, or encouraging and providing opportunities for the community to identify their strengths, their weaknesses and uh, social actors they can work, work with in the struggle they, they, they have to fight so it allowed them to do, it's the efficient cause we would say in philosophy, to, to increase their power of bringing about the, the change the political, in, in the political realm, the political change they, they want to. And finally, growing environmental awareness, which has to do with uh, why environmental sustainability is fundamental and how can it be pursued if we live uh, in a living world, and if we keep killing this world, uh, we will die at the end together. So how can we do, how can we uh, act in order to, to, to try different solutions for that? And so this, that's the, the last uh, uh, empowering dimension we identified. Well, 
Uh, popular engineering aims to organically address all these dimensions. So we, we understand this type of uh, engineering practice, a high density practice concerning the, the empowering dimensions uh, social technical interventions possess. And, and in addition to that, popular engineering aims to do this uh, in a, with a very, uh, with a lot of critical sense and care. It allows them potentially to provide a uh, high quality uh, intervention or social technical assistance. So uh, in order for popular engineering to bring about these products, uh, this, uh, to, to, to do, to be able to, to practice popular engineering, we need uh, what we call educated engineers. There are the, this professional idea, professional uh, profile we idealize or we try to, to develop. This people, this person, this educated engineer is someone that's in addition to the conventional social technical knowledge we uh, learn uh, on engineering schools are we are also it's, this person is someone capable of being empathic and of caring, uh, someone that has a critical sense, uh, someone that's capable of committing to the group's political fights. Uh, popular engineering is not, all, is not only about going there and trying to find, figure in out with the community, the social technical solutions for their problems, but fighting uh, side by side with the community or their, their political struggles. And so it, it's also someone that's fundamentally capable of committing to the group's political fights. And finally, someone uh, capable of learning with the group's knowledge how to practice this type of emancipating engineering, which has to do also to do with enlarging even their technical scientific knowledge. Also in the first presentation, uh, we had something about that. Well, and now I will present uh, uh, in a very briefly two uh, educative process that, that are developed by two uh, popular engineering teams that are somewhat uh, well institutionalized here in Brazil. Well, the first one is this ITCP at the State University of Campinas and how they provide this uh, training for practicing, they provide their members a training for practicing uh, popular engineering. Well, something that's very that's central to every popular engineering team and formative educative initiative is the centrality of uh, practice. So the incubation, that's the second element uh, here. Uh, the incubation has to do with this. So uh, go to, to the field and work alongside the, the social group or the social movement we are working with. It's, it's a fundamental element. So, uh, for this uh, practice to, to be provided, there are also uh, senior popular engineers that can help uh, those who are uh, starting with popular engineering to, to, to learn how to, to do that. But in addition to that, they conjugate this incubation group with a study group. Uh, with, where theoretical uh, knowledge and skills are practiced like critical, critical thought, but also where we, they, they can learn uh, the social conditions and political condition, and economic condition for their vulnerability they are working with to, to, to exist and to, to not being, uh, haven't been overcome yet. And uh, well, to understand this and social technology and the, the, the role the engineering has in all of that. So that is for practicing uh, popular engineering. But as I mentioned at the beginning, popular engineering is uh, highly committed to the solidarity economy ideals. And one of these ideals, central ideals is self-management. So uh, as part of the training for people that participates at the ITCP in the camp, uh, they have to participate in the management of the, the, the technical team, the, the, the ITCP itself. It's part of the training. And, but they do not have, at least not so far, formal classes. It happens, as I mentioned, uh, extension is, is mandatory in Brazil. So every university has to provide that. So we find, because of this, piece of legislation, a possibility to provide complementary education outside classes and some uh, of the curricular activities we have. And the second uh, 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 
team, it's OTEC at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. It's the oldest uh, popular engineering team here in Brazil and the most well established. And they work in, in a similar way, similar way uh, as ITCP does. Uh, they pro they uh, have a, a currently six different projects they develop uh, simultaneously. And for each project, they have a team of about six students. And for each team, they, they have uh, these bi-weekly seminars. And uh, this general formation uh, for the six teams, it's concerning the, the, the theoretical reflection, etc. And But also, like I, at ITCP, what is central here is the immersive supporting practice they have at these six different, different projects. Also, uh, taking part of the management of the of SOTEC is part of this training. And in, different from uh, ITCP, they have they offer two elective undergraduate disciplines at the engineering school, and they have this master's program in technology for social development. As for association, they are pretty much the same. Uh, teachers can associate to these initiatives. As I said, it's this extension, which is mandatory to Brazilian university higher education. So teachers are to a certain extent encouraged to do that. So they can associate to these uh, initiatives as either as a volunteer, a registered extensionist or a research advisor, any students as volunteer, registered extensionist or a researcher, grad or undergrad research. For SOTEC, it's the same. One additional thing is that this association can also be through this, uh, like these two elective undergraduate disciplines I mentioned before, uh, through this max theoretical and practical discipline. So part of this, uh, the, the theoretical practice in classroom discipline and for the, the practical uh, side, they go to the field and work along with one of these six projects. So to finish, Popular engineering aims, as I've been saying, to associate with the social movements and also to traditional communities like indigenous and quilombolas, those uh, descendants from runaway enslaved people here in Brazil. And they associate with these people to help co-design uh, another possible world. And this is what emancipation means for popular engineering. And to do so, they require educated engineers, people who are open to learn what social technical or cosmo technical orders are to be co constructed. And that has to do with this ontological layer of this type of engineering practice. Uh, what engineering and reality is, and what engineering and reality can be about. So that's the, the first layer. And uh, the second, uh, they are also this educated engineer committed to the community's political fights for this other possible order, because it's not only to think about what can it be, but also to associate with the group to fight for this order to, to come true. So this is the second layer, this political layer. The third layer is continuously learn how to do emancipating engineering, which has to do with methodologies, but also, and most time forgotten, supporting technical scientific knowledge in a way that the mainstream technical scientific knowledge is not sufficient for bringing these other orders about. This is the epistemological layer. And the last layer uh, is they must act, these popular engineers or educated engineers, with care, empathy, and critical sense. And this is the ethical layer. So the ethics is one among other three layers that popular engineers engineering uh, has to address. So here are the references I made use of in this presentation, reference in English. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. And I will re re really be glad to receive comments, questions, critiques, suggestions, and even requests for copies of my works, either now in the Q&A time we have, but also through this email address. So that's it. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Cristiano. Um, that uh, shows a really good example of really immersive active learning. Um, so uh, it's fascinating how it's, it's structured. Um, I, I've got a question from Patricia. Uh, it's in the chat. Um, so Patricia says, can you elaborate on the specific tools and techniques you employ to nurture qualitative, qualitative uh, relationships? And how do the engineering students or staff adapt to using them? 
Yeah, and that's it's interesting. It's very also Latin American. We are famous for this. A lot of hugs, a lot of affection, and this is part of the, the intervention. Uh, there is one example. This a technical team they were working with this mine. Uh, I guess it's coal miners, and they also participate uh, at their their parties. And at the end, they have this farewell par party. Everyone cries, and but it, it's not so. It's not about uh, shallow or or uh, emotion. It's, a, it's about committing uh, and to, to construct bonds. And this is, it's based, uh, it's uh, for uh, the techno technical, te technocratic uh, role we are taught to, to play. It's very difficult because we have to, to construct a wall, uh, effective wall, an impersonal wall. We are the technical team. We have the only professional relationship with the clients we have. That's not the case here. We are committed, as I said, uh, to, to the, the political struggles. So in order for this to happen, at least in the Brazilian ground or Latin American ground, we can, we have to go to be there with them. And sometimes there, the situation, what, how is that practiced? It's practiced in practice. I mean, when in, in, in the intervention itself. So in many situations, the technical team is at, for, for instance, a cooperative of waste pickers. And once they are there trying to address some, some issue they have together identified for, uh, beforehand, uh, arises a problem there. That's not a problem that was supposed to be solved, but it's a problem that becomes urgent to, the, to this group. And the, the team assumes this as, this problem as part of their, their, their duty too. So it's constructed like pretty much this, at least in the US and Canada, I lived in Canada for a year and it was very interesting to, to experience this there, this uh, community uh, bonds, uh, the North America culture tries to develop or, or at least in some past age. So it's, it's being there as part of a community and accepting this, it has some setbacks because we get sometimes frustrated. Uh, their, their defeats, political defeats are, our, are ours too because we are effective, uh, effectively involved in the situation. But it's only with this involvement that this type of engineering, as far as, as we can see, can be actually practiced. I, I'm not sure I, I answered the question. I, but, uh, well. Asha, you, you can uh, comment if you, if you... Yeah, no, no, you did. Yeah, and it, 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 is, it is, I've seen the same thing with my students. We struggle to move away from that professional stance and, and connect human to human. Um, it's, it's something that they really struggle with. So I think centering Yeah, that. but I, I think that something that works here is because, uh, like someone said before uh, in the presentation, I, I'm not sure it was the first or second presentation, to go into the community and to, to, to realize that they are real people and to associate with them in understanding what they are going through and in, in, in taking this as also a responsibility for ourselves to try to, to help this improve. But it's uh, uh, one uh, point here in Brazil that we have this affirm affirmative uh, politics, policy, I'm sorry. Uh, and we have uh, received at university from 2005, six on, uh, a lot of groups of underserved communities. And interestingly, they are overrepresented in this technical team. They made off at least, I, I guess, about 20 to 30% of the, the, the students at university. But when it comes to this technical, to this engaged or engineering practice, they are sometimes 50% of those there. So perhaps also this allows them and the entire group to, to build uh, stronger connections, I guess. I'll take, there's one more question here from uh, Annabella. Um, would you say that popular engineering is more or less like service-based based, uh, engineering or service-based learning? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yes. Great. Um, and there was 
Sorry, you want to carry on? Anna? Sorry, I just wanted to uh, touch upon um, something that Cristiano just mentioned. So do you feel like, because uh, he did say that some of the underrepresented are being overly represented in some scenarios. Do you feel like uh, this has like an impact on the overall decision making of a team or is it, um, is it a subtle difference or is it like a more profound difference? And what is that kind of difference, if there is? Yeah, that's something. very, very good question. Thank you for, for asking me that. It's something that these groups are trying to figure out now. Th their idea is that not to do uh, engineering and solving problems in, 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 for people, but along with them. And to, to, to help them to, to be the, the, to have their voice listened. So they, uh, now, when these underrepresented community members enter engineering, it's more legitimate that these people uh, be the, the one in place to decide. And so they are trying to, to navigate into that their direction. And they have this as their ideals to do with them, not a, uh, for them. But uh, they are, they are, I think that as for now, it's not very uh, clear how and to what extent this change what they have been doing. But thank you for, for your question. Thank you. Um, we have run out of time, but MSA had uh, their hand raised. Do you want to ask your question? Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I actually, so uh, I just wanted to say I'm a student at the University of Cape Town and I'm doing my final year. So I think everyone and he has like on the other side of the spectrum and I'm on the other side of the spectrum. So just listening to everyone's comments and everything, um, for one, gives me really like hope to say that this is very, like we're going in the right direction. Because um, my experience, I come from, I come, in South Africa, if you guys probably follow the news and everything, you would know that currently we're having one of the biggest riots and everything. But the main problem is that this has been going on and it will still go on because we have the highest um, amount of, of inequality in the country and as someone who comes from an inequality part of South Africa to come into a state of the art university and learn everything feeling out of place and all of that and for me I mean the first presenter spoke about it and I, I, I never understood why engineers never have ever been considered as um, as public servants an engineer is a public servant you know when you do um, uh, medicine in, in, in my university take UCT, um, when you apply, you are, you are required to do public service as a high school student. It, as an engineer, you do not design in a vacuum. You do not design in South Africa that didn't have apartheid for more than 40 years. You design in a, in a South Africa that has all these other social problems. And so for me, it's always been a problem that, that we have this idea um, that one, first of all, as engineers, we design in a vacuum, but also this um, this identification, I mean, one of the things, even in my family, by the way, um, since I started engineering, everyone wants to listen to me and everyone wants to give me this opportunity because you are the engineer, you know, um, this idea that we are perfect and, 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 and any critique to us is, is a critique to, 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 the, to the science and to the, you know, that, and, and that, so for, for me, I feel like it is something, seeing this, and I hope that at least um, this could be applied more to our, to our mainstream course because for me, my interest only came as electives and things that I was doing on the side. It was never a thing that this is the mainstream course and this is what you need to do. And the truth is, we are still going to see more of these problems because we, as the engineers that are currently designing now, have never ever considered that they design for poor people or even the idea that actually the people that you're designing for actually might hold one of the best informations that you need for your solution. That, that the information that they have is practical because they are on the ground. You coming with information that you have learned off. And this idea of actually listening to the other person and getting um, their side view of things. So I really appreciated this. Like I honestly really appreciated this from the first um, speaker. I've been making notes and I, I have a few, um, I have a few even readings that I want to do now because of, of this conference. So I truly, truly appreciate this. Um, and the other point was that I've been struggling with this idea of, do I then want to go and work and, and build um, bridges as I've always dreamt, or do I then want to go in 
to the, the, the much more um, philosophical part of engineering. Because I, I think the other big problem that we face in our country is the, the corruption. And I think that's a much more philosophical problem um, of um, not, only just, not only just the fact that the, for me, when I look at the problem, I understand that there are politicians and everything, but I believe that at the root of that tender or of that project, there's an engineer who designed that. And there's an engineer who needs to account why does the road peel after three days or why does that house, the RTP houses or the houses that are offered to the population of South Africa crack after three days, you know? So there's an engineer at the bottom and the truth is um, the engineer had to, be, had to allow it, had to allow for the corruption to happen. The engineer had to overlook the quality of the work that had to be done. So and I'm, I'm doing my final year. I literally have six months left and I'm really not sure like what, which direction I want to go. So this was it really just like stirred the pot that was settling because um, my research project is, uh, is on the, um, dam safety and everything. But now like I'm again going back into, I need to think what I want to do. So I really appreciate each and every, this, each and every speaker that spoke. And um, I, I really hope that we could do more. And, and I really hope that would be mainstream, that this wouldn't just be a conference that we have on the side. Because I feel like another thing that we always assume is that this information that we hold is too sophisticated for the general public. I believe it's, um, Einstein says that if you cannot simplify it, then you do not understand it. I believe that we can simplify these matters to the general public of the people who are suffering on the ground to understand that, yeah, I don't want to carry on because there's just, I've, it's, it's really been an, an exciting evening. I'm studying for an exam tomorrow, but I sat here for the two hours and yeah. So thank you so much. I truly, really appreciate it. I, I appreciate that you also joined us. Um and gave us those um, really interesting, useful comments. Um, thank you and good luck for your exam. <laughs> I, I have to move on um, to our last speaker. I'm sorry, Patricia, for taking some of your time. Um, our fourth and final speaker is Patricia Xavier, who's a water engineer with a background in both the private and public water sector. She's currently an associate professor at Swansea University, UK. She has expertise in the design of flood um, alleviation schemes and wastewater networks. She leads on academic program enhancement and development for the College of Engineering and is the academic student engagement lead for the college, as well as a member of the Academy Howell Tavy, I hope I got the Welsh correct, which is the Wales Peace Academy. She's a strong advocate of student voice and partnership with students and is interested in exploring the conflicts between student voice uh, and institutional and staff resilience. Her main area of research is into social impact of engineers and engineering, particularly critiquing how the methodologies adopted by engineers can sometimes run counter to the needs of communities they serve and reinforce structures of power that maintain inequality. I'm really happy to have you, Patricia. Apologies for the shortened time. Um, I'll, I'll pass it to you. Not a problem at all. Um, hopefully I'll come in under time anyway. So I wanna talk about um, a, a MSc that we've run and really the journey that we've had with it and some reflections on that and trying to move towards justice-centered work in engineering and how hard that is and where the barriers are and some ways that we can maybe start to pick at those barriers. Um, so in about 2015-16, we were having discussions between myself and some political scientists at Swansea University as well about our own experiences engaged in development as engineers or as international development professionals, so from the social science perspective. Um, so we shared this background in working in resource poor environments, um, places with lack of formal governments and, and having very, very direct relationships with stakeholders. And it all collectively noticed that the engineers um, were typically spending much more time on solutions rather than context and understanding the problems um, and regularly deprioritizing that social context. So everything that everyone's spoken about already, you know, this is a conversation that's been going on for, for decades. Um, and that, that lack of self-awareness around engineering and what engineering is. So we came together, um, looked at the literature, and there's a lot of work, as I said, on on, on characterising the lack of social awareness of engineers and we drew upon that, came up with a, an MSc, the Sustainable Engineering Management for International Development. So it started in 2017, it's been running about 12 months. The talk content is engineering, critical management studies, political science. It's quite an interesting combination. Um, we deliver that in two week intense blocks. And our intake is mixed as well. So we've got engineers, business students, social scientists, psychologists, um, sports scientists as well. Uh, and the, the whole premise of the course is to make it 
completely project led and project based. So the students are learning their taught modules and they're learning about community engagement, but at the same time, they're working with a partner and that's normally an international partner or it's a local partner to Swansea. So they're reinforcing and they're learning this, this taught content and they're applying that then in their relationship with their partner. Some of the modules we, we give them tools for international development, monitoring, impact evaluation, circular economy. I think the, what you'd expect from this type of MSc. Um, and then the deliverables from the project point of view are kind of tied into the timing of, of this of this delivery. Now, what we found over um, a number of years is that this is, is really hard to get right. So we are linking what they're learning with how they're practicing with their project partner, but we see again and again um, some observable differences between the way that the engineers are approaching the work. And what's fascinating is watching the group of students and, and the different um, epistemological basis that they come from and the methodological toolkit that they bring depending on where they come from. And it really shines a light on the deficit within engineering to tackle justice and to community engagement. So as an example, our engineers, they tend to be very much, again, focused on the solution. They're, they're interested in that, that technical solution. They get very frustrated um, in that grey phase of the project where you're exploring and you're trying to understand what's happening. Um, and once they once they're alighting on a, on a technical element, and um, there's an element of blinkering that comes in, and, and zeroing in. There's a comfort zone. There's a real comfort around around them finding that okay, my toolkit does apply. I'm going to embrace this, and then forgetting the wider context. Um, social scientists provide a really interesting tension. They're very typically reluctant to commit to any 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 design. And they ask really difficult questions all the time and they often rebel against us as educators and against the other students um, um, if, if they don't feel that the, the right things are being considered. They're also much better at identifying appropriate interventions than our engineers. And we find this again and again, our social scientist students sometimes come in and they'll see really early on what the appropriate intervention is. It'll take the engineers a lot longer to go round and, and, and zero in on that. As one example, um, one of the very first years we ran this, one of our partners is, is a school in, in Zambia. Um, the students went there initially to look at a classroom project. Uh, well, the social scientist student said they don't need a classroom, they need a fence because um, the, the boundaries of the school uh, were, were on, on, the bench, on the edge of a major road and they were losing a couple of students every single year due to traffic accidents. Um, the engineers did not like this at all because it didn't fit their bill of what a typical engineering impactful project would be, but in the end that's what they did and it was the best and the most appropriate solution, but it was the social scientists who saw that, not the engineers. Um, they also, both of them, underestimate the complexity of community engagement and especially entering it from a justice centre and they get very distressed by complex issues and, and lash out. Um, when they're engaging with that complexity. Um, so the great thing about this course is I'm an engineer, but my colleagues are political scientists, psychologists, um, social scientists, critical management scholars. Um, and they could really hold a mirror up for me to understand how they saw engineers and what they were seeing. That's something I never had before. And that's something that's really completely changed my viewpoint of what my job is as an engineering educator. So that, you know, they would typically admire us for a can-do attitude, like we will go in there with positivity and energy and, and, and look for solutions and assume that there will be a solution. Um, but together with that, there's an over-ambition, there's a lack of humility, a lack of being able to listen, a lack of being able to take perspectives from others, um, a tendency to see engineering as inherently good as opposed to contextually. Um, and then also this big, big gap in understanding qualitative methodologies, um, lacking a language, lacking criticality, lacking understanding of power and justice and terminologies and the frameworks around that. Um, so we, we've tried to put these in, we've made a few different tweaks and changes over the years to try and see if we can start to center more just and more, more equitable conversations in and, and, and ways of being for the students, mixed success. So one thing is um, inductive methodologies our students know really, they know the scientific method. They're coming in, our engineering students are coming in very fluent and very adept with scientific method, deductive thinking. They don't even really know that inductive methods exist. So we started to talk to them much more about induction, about qualitative research, um, get them to practice grounded methods, observation as a way of 
starting to explore the world in a different way. However, does it work? Very few students seem to be able to grasp these concepts for long. So we might practice these um, exercises, we might introduce an introduction, we might talk about um, creating a primary record, uh, but they need constant reminding to treat this qualitative information as valid. They really struggle to acknowledge it as valid. It, it, it seems to, it's almost, it goes in one ear and out the other. It's not landing. It's not, I think it's, it's, it's not in that valid domain of what engineering is, isn't it? It's not being retained. It's really proving really hard to get them to retain that sense that qualitative data is as important, if not more important than the quantitative data that they're exploring. Um, a lot of them start off making a lot of journal entries, collecting positive data, but very little of that makes it to the final dissertation. There's a lack of a follow through. And again, it's that sense, it's that lack of respect for qualitative data. Um, the students that do tend to have a supervisor who is qualitative and, and is constantly pushing them to look at it. But, but without that really strong support from someone experienced in that, the students are really struggling to, to get hold of inductive methodologies. So I'm just going to try and close the door. I'm looking here frozen in the background. So I think this um, is very deeply ingrained and it does affect the way that the students can uh, see, see valid other ways of seeing and knowing. Um, and these inductive methods, they, they just in the minds of the students and the activities and observing them and how they behave and how they talk about what they're seeing and what they're doing, they seem to hold a peripheral supporting and like an arbitrary role. So there's something we're still working on. It's just an observation or reflection. Um, and something I think we need to look more at. I think this is really important for anyone engaged in, for any engineer, um, to be able to understand and explore qualitative data and, and do that in a rigorous way. Another thing we've done more and more as the years go by is talk about power. So we're talking about hegemony. Again, students don't know these words, they don't have these concepts, they don't have these frameworks. I don't think I had these frameworks when I started off, um, certainly not as a, as a novice engineer. So we do, we talk about hegemony, we talk about, we give them some intercultural exercises. They're, they're a very diverse group from all over the world, these MSc students, they come from everywhere. So we use them as a little mini study group to explore differences in communication, personal space, um, and then look at positionality, provision bias with them. Does it work? Well, as I said, they're often brand new concepts. Um, they, they, they really enjoy this. It, it, a lot of them um, express how, why have we never been given words for these, these things before they exist? And we can talk, we're now, we, we could never talk about these things before because no one had given us the language to talk about them. And um, students are really grateful that, that we, we give them to this. And this strikes me every single year. And how do you get to 22, 23 and not have these concepts? But, but that's where I was, that happened to me. Um, a lot of the Western students, um, as a part of this process, they're having to confront their own taken for granted assumptions about post-colonial societies, and this is really traumatic, there's no other way to put it. Um, so media, UK media in particular, feeds us images and stories of passive Africa and, and you know, implicit Western superiority. Uh, and the students are confronting that they have been complicit in upholding oppression, oppressive modes of thought. And, and, and behaviours. That's really hard and that requires a lot of intense specialised support and we're lucky that we have a psychologist on our team um, who, who takes that role. Uh, so there is a massive ethical responsibility attached to asking explorations of power as soon because you can't do that in, a, in an objective way. That is a very personal um, process to think about your own power and how that manifests and how you have been complicit in oppression. Uh, and so to do that and open that box without having that support is, I think, risky. Um, and it's something that I think few engineering faculty are equipped to deal with. And I think I am only equipped to deal with it having gone through it. So now I'm being able to take, stu like, to take students through, through it as well. Um, but having the support of that psychologist, basically, is one reason that I, I don't, I, I feel like that safety net is there. However, this is all unknown to me when I started out. Um, it's been learning curve. One thing we found really useful is critical reflection. So we use Reynolds framework and it draws on Paolo Freire's work on emancipatory pedagogy. Um, and of all of the different interventions and, and, and methodologies and things that we've, we've spoken to the students about, this is the one that I really feel has opened a door into getting students to understand where they sit 
in terms of power relations with the community that they're working with. So Reynolds asks us to look at reflection through four lenses. Um, question that's taken for granted assumptions, try and root them out and dig underneath and where is this assumption coming from? Focus on the social relations, so it's an interrelational reflection, it's not centred on the individual, it's on that individual's position to community members, to, to me as the educator, to the funder body, um, to their parents, to society. And then um, it, Reynolds also asks us to reveal power relations, so what are those relations of power between these different actors in this complicated web that students are? Um, operating in when they're working with community engagement and again very free area and being directed towards emancipation so centering justice and and using critical reflection as a as a means of accessing and thinking about how we can practice in just ways so in practice we do this we are with the students will have a critical incident now it may be a conversation with me or it may be something that happened in the shop it may be something in the um, on the project, it, it's actually we don't draw boundaries over where those critical incidents are. We ask them to find something that's niggling. So where was there? Did you observe injustice occur? Did you feel uncomfortable about a power imbalance that you've been part of? Um, did you maybe handle a situation in a way that you're not proud of and you want to explore it? So we ask for these critical incidents and then get them to look at Reynolds and, and, and use those four different lenses to explore that critical incident um, with a lot of guidance. We, this is quite a sort of a, an open feedback. It's also whatever they're willing to share. We don't ask them to share anything they're not willing to share. It's, it's, it's led by the students and what they want to bring. Um, they, they, we, we get a lot of feedback from the students that they really value this of all the tools on the on the MSC. The engineers um, like this because it, 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 it helps them to take a really messy or traumatic, difficult situation and process it start to find ways of um, incorporating lessons learned into their way of being and their professionality I guess. Um, Gabrielle, this uh, one of my colleagues Gabrielle, she's finishing her PhD quite soon, the reference is down at the bottom. Um, she had a paper in ASW last year which sort of digs into a lot of the reflections so if you're interested take a screenshot and have a look. Um, we, we had some really good findings from that. We saw that the students were able to over the over the course of the, the MSc, they did a number of different reflections and so we were able to see the progression and the depth of reflection that was being achieved and the, 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 relation, the, the amount they discussed power, the amount they were able to unpick what was happening below the surface of the incidents. Um, and it does appear to help them get that updated sense of who they are, trying to integrate these new experiences into their professional identity. Some of the excerpts, I'll just read you some. So the trip created many negative feelings for me and made me question whether our intervention was worthwhile. Will we really affect people's lives? In addition, if not, is it really okay to implement these projects in developing countries simply as a learning experience for students? Isn't that exploitative? That was one. Um, another, it's a different student. These experiences also serve as for me a sense of hypocrisy for concentrating my efforts of development work abroad as opposed to my nuclear community. In doing so, I began to unearth deep-rooted feelings of confusion and anger in the search for my own identity and purpose and development. Um, I think a lot of us involved in development often have that kind of instinctual discomfort. And um, before I found critical reflection, before we found critical reflection as, as a tool, it, it would be a feeling of discomfort and it would be a conversation, it would be gone. Um, critical reflection gives you a way to sort of make a lot more of those incidents and learn in, in a way that I hadn't had before. It's also co-reflexive. I've been massively affected by what the students write, uh, write hugely. Um, so when they are talking about an incident that they were involved in, um, I will find that I learn from what they've written. Then I can take the lesson learned back to advising other students when they start to write their reflections or they are in a similar incident. So I'm learning, they're learning the whole time. And that is hard and what that made us realize is actually the whole basis of the course had kind of been conceived um, with that western superiority kind of mindset and it was through the critical reflections of the students that we came to realize that and came to recenter it and came to try and find um, you know better and more just ways of working so one little example of that i guess when we first set the project up um, we were working with communities in sierra leone and Zambia 
we were doing that in a fairly context-free way. So we didn't ask the students to look at the history of the region. We didn't get them to think about, well, what is the UK's role in, in, these, in, these, in these places? How does that affect day-to-day -day relationships? How does that, what are the implications um, of, of all that, that horrible history? Um, and how does that impact and how do they surface in, in your project interactions? And what does that mean for you? Um, so we now do that and we now make sure that the students do think more deeply about that web, where they are in their historical contextual web. But I think we'd have got there had we not been confronted so bruisingly, you know, by the students reflecting and picking up on these issues. So it's it's been a massive learning curve, but really good. I'm just going to finish on something. My other co-author, Natalie Albuquerque, is also here in the room. Um, I just want to pick up on this because this draws on her work. She's also coming up to the end of her PhD. Um, it's a slightly different tag angle. She's looking at values. So using the Schwartz um, circular motivational continuum, which is a way of mapping values, so personal values, and the way that we um, see the world. So what are the values that underpin our decision making? And there's a lot of research showing that STEM careers are perceived as less likely than other careers to fill communal goals. And there's, other, there's another reference here showing that um, empathy correlates negatively with people who are primed with agentic or personal values. So the, the way to look at this graph is you have um, one half, you've got self-enhancement in the lower right hand corner, self-transcendence in the upper left hand quadrant. And these are opposing values. So one is self-enhancement is very, very personal. And it's about personal motivation, um, ambition, I suppose, or, or individualism. Whereas the other self-transcendence is more about the community related values. So Natalie and Gabrielle started off on very, very different um, topics, but actually they've come together in what they're doing because Natalie's work is quite nice and showing how uh, one of the problems we have in engineering is, is getting students to realise that interconnection, interdependency, which is associated with these values of self-transcendence and community. But those are not where the values that are being cultivated and encouraged through engineering education lie. So there's a massive tension there. Um, so just as a, as a last thought, really, to think, I think we need to think a lot more carefully about the values, because decision making comes from values. It, it, values are what underlies the way that we behave and we operate. And the values that we're aspiring to in this group, you know, and, and the profession, um, there's a disconnect there between, between the values of wanting to, 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 to be communal and, and act in a way that supports humanity um, and the values that actually, that are being generated in, in engineering education. So that's, I think, really interesting and, and useful place to start to look at. Um, so justice is the work of a lifetime. It never finishes and I think we always learn uh, but I think it's really conceptually hard and, and destabilizing for those of us who are trained in, in engineering I think it's hard because we come from um, you know the little box that we were talking about earlier that's our comfort zone whereas justice is relational and it is it is totally messy and that's hard so I think a lot of people just turn away because it's easier to turn away than it is to lean in and engage with it um, because we have these gaps we have these big gaps in our frameworks and our knowledge but I do think critical reflection and also the language around hegemony, um, social structures of power as well, all of that starts to create spaces for that and, and, and helps us to find ways of repairing what engineering, the damage engineering done is kind of how I see it. Um, and I, again and again, whenever these students come to this course, I feel like we're having to unpick what they've learned. They've been trained for three or four years in one way of being and knowing, one set of epistemological and ontological norms. Um, and we're having to unpick that and confront that. And they find that upsetting and I find that upsetting. Much rather we were building engineers from the ground up with this, this backbone of justice. Um, this quote is not actually attributed, it's attributed to Fred Douglas, but apparently it's not, I looked up today. It's easier to build strong children than repair broken men. And I, I do like that because that's what I'm finding. I'm finding the students are coming in and they're not, they're, they're broken, they're missing fundamental pieces of almost being human. Um, that's a bit strong, but they're missing fundamental pieces of being able to act 
and with justice. So the more we can reorientate undergraduate education, um, so that is that is inbuilt with them. It's not something they have to relearn and 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 challenge their identity later on, which not everyone's ready to do. I think I think they're better. I think that's it. I'm done. Many thanks, Patricia. It is a, a big learning of a uh, journey of self discovery, isn't it? It sounds like you've had that journey as well. Um, it's been great to, to hear that. We, we're bang on the hour, so um, I'd like to take a question. If anyone does need to leave, um, please do. Um, so yeah, I'll, we'll take a, one or two questions and then we'll, we'll wrap up. I'm just gonna pop um, Gabrielle's paper in the chat. And also Natalie's got two papers in a subly this, this coming session, two weeks time. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll quickly ask then, um, so I, I share the same thing as you, that this is really something that's fundamentally missing from our engineering programmes. And as you said, uh, the backbone of justice needs to be there. Um, you've developed this as a master's programme. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it can be started off much earlier or do you think this is such a uh, em emotional journey that maybe they do need to mature or, or what, what's your views on that? No, I think I think what Christiana was, was doing about embedding that learning contextually early on allows that to develop, co-develop. I think I think they're not exclusive. I think you can. I, I hope you can. Not that everyone believes me or agrees with me. This is what I try and say. Is if we do contextualize that learning, they're not learning in a silo, are they? And they are learning about justice at the time, and they're learning about thermodynamics at the same time. So those concepts become intertwined the whole way through. Um, rather than them being treated separately, but it's... And in fact, I, I suppose that's where the, the problem is, that you, you find that once they've graduated and they've come to your master's programme, you've had, a, had to unlearn all those things. So is there any plans to, to bring them much earlier in the programme for undergraduates? Yeah, we're trying to. We've got a few different um, modules in. Uh, at the minute, it's very discreet. I mean, I mean, what we need to do is really weave it through the whole programme. Um, so we do have discrete modules in engineering design and, and, and um, social context, environmental context, where we are addressing these themes and looking at ethics and trying to give them frameworks for exploring ethics, but it's, it doesn't work when it's bolt on and we're still at that stage. Yeah. So I'm really intrigued, but there are some interesting educational models, you know, around which are looking at more of an ecological hybrid model. I think Alberg in, in Denmark is looking at this and having a a curriculum that looks at that macro micro ethical framework the whole way through so much more project-based learning approach and asking those questions i think that i think that's that is one of the solutions that's one of the ways to do it um roland you had a question in the chat do, do you want to to ask it Sure. I was just I was just picking up, Patricia, on uh, you were talking about the emotions which were raised mm. for the students and, and indeed for for you in, in that process. And, and it, it strikes me that you're doing the right thing, which is in terms of leaning into it, um, you know, taking taking on board the idea that the emotion needs to happen and that you need supports for you and for them to enable it to happen. It also strikes me that that for a lot of people, they would do the opposite thing. They would just run away from it um and, and say okay well we need to stop doing this because it's all getting too emotional um so i, I mean it just it, it I, I guess i was linking it to the conversation earlier on about paulo freire the idea did you know the idea that education and engineering is politics you're either doing engineering and education for status quo or you're doing it for change and and the minute you do it for change it raises emotions uh, emotions of anger, emotions of fear, emotions of hope, and and actually we need we need to do that, right? We need we need to build those supports for for people around around doing it emotionally. Um, yeah, so I I, mean, I I I'm not sure that it it's it stopped being a question um, and started being a comment. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay. Um, Thank you, Roland. Um, do you want to comment on that, oh, Patricia? No, it's going to refer back to a comment that Aditya made, um, which sort of reminds me of this and saying, like, you know, engineers come from this ideology of um, serving colonialism and imperialism. Uh, and that is invisible to most people, but that is where we are. 
and um, I don't know if you can do justice work unless you confront that that's actually the modus operandi that you've had up to now, um, and that is hard to do. But I, I don't know if I had a point. <laughs> I was just reflecting. Um, but I think I think the digital point is really relevant. So servicing those structures and, and, and as a way as a, as a opens the door then, and it is emotional and it is hard. But that the way that the ideology of imperialism and colonialism has, has been to not engage with emotion and it does sever your emotional response from your practical response. Um, you mentioned about the confidence of, of, of practitioners and engineering educators not having that kind of confidence to tackle it. Um, but but you found that um, safety net you're saying uh, with, with your colleagues. Mm. Yes. Yeah, I don't know if I would have gone got like gone done it without without that because it was it was someone to, to talk to to cry with you know and without that it's it's it, it, I don't know if I would have bothered to be quite frank. Yeah, similarly, I I, uh, I reached out to an ethicist uh, when I was putting things together and and checking if if I wasn't doing the the, the wrong things. So I totally understand that. Mm. Um, I, I wanted to wrap this up now. It's, it's six past the hour. Um, so thank you all for joining us in this session. Clara, thank you for running the show. Um, and for Diana, Martin, for um, putting together this seminar, these webinar series, they've been so, so brilliant. And today's session, there's so many questions. I've listed like a dozen that I couldn't ask. Um, and I'm sorry for those who weren't able to, to get theirs answered as well. But I hope you can take this offline um, and reach out to, to our speakers. Uh, you're very welcome to. Uh, Clara has also posted um, the CEFI conference that's coming up in September. Um, and I hope to meet some of you there. Um, and I'll, I think I'll wrap up if there's anything else, Diana, that, or Clara to add. Hi, maybe just uh, to add that we are welcoming you to CEFI at the annual conference where we have many uh, workshops on ethics, not only, let's say, by our working group, but just looking at the registration. Uh, I think there are about seven or eight workshops, and uh, there will also be a dedicated session where we are trying to put together a handbook dedicated to engineering ethics education, and we are searching for voices, for diverse voices, for diverse perspectives uh, to, um, to continue this dialogue that is much needed. Thank you, everyone. And we wish you a beautiful summer and we will see each other with new energy uh, beginning with this autumn. Definitely. And thank you for the speakers. Um, appreciate that you shared your personal and professional journeys. I hope that we can also, um, with this social responsibility, bring justice in our own education, pardon the pun. And um, yeah, I hope to see you all in another webinar. Many thanks. Bye.